Good to see everybody. Thank yeah. The, it's uh, that time of year you can pull out the sweater and it's not. I think it's supposed to rain today. Maybe snow tomorrow. So pull out your sweaters. Although. It might be a little bit too warm for today because it's a lot warmer standing right here than it is sitting back there. So I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's the lights or that I'm closer to the heater anyway. I don't know. I'm actually from Texas, so uh, I, that's it. I'm in the hot seat. Boy, there, that's, there's a whole lot of truth in that statement right there. <laughs> All right, if you have your uh, bulletin, um, pull that out. We got some announcements going on. Uh, after the service, uh, we'll take a short break. We'll get set up for our uh, civil rights training, and it's just going to be a slideshow presentation that I'm going to go through. It's not going to take very long um, because. Uh, since our program is a little bit different, uh, the whole thing doesn't apply to us. Um, but uh, we do need to go through it for our annual um, partnership with St. Mary's Food Alliance. And uh, so we will do that after the service today. So if you're a food bank volunteer or you'd like to be a food bank volunteer, um, you can stay for that. And we'll go through that and there'll be a little bit of paperwork involved. Um, but it's not, it's not very difficult. Coming up on Tuesday this week, we're going to have our ministry team meeting, and we'll be uh, discussing our budget for each ministry in that meeting. And uh, so if you're a ministry team leader, if you've got any budget questions, uh, you can ask me those today. I might can answer some today, but we'll be discussing those on Tuesday. So be thinking about what you might need for your budget uh, for this next year. And then this Thursday, uh, we have our food bank uh, coming up on Thursday. And then Sunday, we will have our quarterly business meeting. And we will have a Christmas dinner uh, following that. Uh, coming up the 22nd, uh, WMU are going to be making uh, trays for those who are homebound. And there's also a senior lunch is going to be. And the senior lunch is going to help with that, uh, with those trays that same day. And then coming up for Christmas Eve and Christmas Day, Christmas Eve, we will have a candlelight service. And we will also have a, a um, Christmas Eve uh, program uh, presentation that night for you all, and uh, along with our candlelight. And then on Christmas morning, we will not have Sunday school that morning. We'll just meet for the service on Christmas morning. That's kind of what we got going on uh, for that. Uh, if you're interested in sending your kids to kids camp, uh, please come and talk with me. I need to know, I need to kind of put a list together by January 1st, because the first week of January is when the registration opens up for kids camp. So if you're interested in kids camp, come talk to me. I can tell you all about it. Um, you could talk to my daughter Priscilla right there. She can tell you how fun it is at kids camp. Uh, Noah can tell you too. Uh, so uh, yeah, make sure you're, if you're interested in that. Also, if you're interested in winter retreat for youth group, uh, see me or see Ken. And also the youth group are selling calendars for 10 bucks. We can also, we also have a special two for 20. And um, so be sure these, these make good gifts for Christmas or for your neighbor or something like that. Grab you one of these. It helps kids uh, go to, to our winter retreat that's coming up in January. Uh, there's also a college retreat coming up in February. So if you're 18 or older and you're interested in going 18 to 29, uh, uh, <laughs> if you're interested in college retreat, come and talk to me about that as well. So we've got a lot of things going on. Uh, with, with that. Now, um, this morning, uh, I'm going to invite you to participate in something that we haven't done in a really long time, since 2019. If you want to participate, you can. If you don't want to, 
that's perfectly fine. But a long time ago, we used to have a meet and greet time, and we haven't, COVID was, the reason we don't do it is because of COVID and health risk and all of that. But if you would like to, as soon as I finish announcements here, we're going to have two minutes of meet and greet time. You can bump elbows or fist bump or shake hands and hug each other's neck. In Texas, we hug each other's neck. <laughs> if you don't want to do that, then don't do it. Uh, be careful of those around you. Don't shake hands with anybody named COVID. Don't shake hands with that dude. And so just be careful. It's at your own risk. But we thought we would bring that back just as a part of, we don't always have time to get to know each other. And two minutes isn't a long time to get to know each other, but at least we can say hi and greet one another, be friendly, and be thankful um, to be in fellowship together. So if you would like to do that, please stand up and do that now in a couple of minutes, and then I'll come up and pray, and we'll get started with our worship time after that. Go buy a calendar. This is a good time to buy a calendar right now. give you <laughs> yeah maybe that's the way I should say it Let's go to the Lord in prayer as we get started with our time of worship this morning. Dear Father, we just thank you so much for blessing us today. And Lord, we uh, thank you so much uh, just for this time of year, Lord, when we hear your praises on the radio. And Lord, we uh, just see things around us uh, more so than normal that remind us of you and uh, Lord, the, the hope that we have in you. We thank you so much for that, Lord. Uh, we just thank you for this time, uh, Lord, today that we've had to fellowship already. And Lord, um, I just pray that you would just uh, uh, just speak into our hearts this morning as we uh, lift up our voices to you in, um, in song. And Lord, as you speak to us through your word this morning, uh, Lord, I thank you so much. And I just pray that you would encourage us, Lord, and... Uh, we um, just give you all honor and glory now for our, our time uh, together and our time in fellowship with you. And we just thank you that it, it is you that draws us together, Father. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good morning, everybody. 
you want to stand and worship with us, please.
lion's den. Give me hope like Moses in the wilderness. Give me a heart like David, hold me my defense. So I can face my giants with confidence. Give me faith like Daniel in the lion's den. Give me hope like Moses in the wilderness. If everyone will have a seat, please. We have a special.
every week you guys have me following up from someone. <laughs> Last week uh, it was from Elizabeth singing her song, and now this week it's from Gabe playing his clarinet. And uh, I'm very thankful for my son and his gifts. I appreciate him and love him and uh, his, his love for music and uh, honored to uh, be able to uh, have him up here and lead and worship with that and, and be a part of worship. So thankful. Uh, I'm thankful for each and every one of my kids. They all have uh, talents and gifts that the Lord has blessed them with. And uh, Christmas is a fun time at our house. We, we do Christmas big at our house, and it's a lot of fun, and glad for them to be at home. So the last couple of weeks, as we've been going through uh, Colossians, uh, last week we looked at the struggles that Paul starts addressing, the struggles that were going on in Colossae at the time, and you had two extreme ends of things. On one side, you had lots of tradition through a lot of the Jewish traditions that would be impressed upon them. And then on the other side, you had this ideas of asceticism and worshiping angels and a a whole different realm of uh, worship style of things of the world. And so they're being pressured on both sides. And we looked at two examples The one example is King Solomon who had everything you could imagine, all the money in the world, all the possessions of the world, and yet at the end of his life, his heart was not fully with the Lord. His heart was pulled away from the Lord through his wives, through the influence they had of other gods, and what he had been told not to do, that's the way he ended up going. And that on the other side of things, we had the example of the woman at the well where so much tradition was stacked up against her, she could not go and worship the Lord. She couldn't, she couldn't go to the temple and worship. She didn't have that opportunity. And so you had two extreme people in their culture who, for one, who had everything you could imagine, and for one, who had absolutely nothing whatsoever And in both instances, it pulls them away from the Lord. And so Paul is warning the Colossians about this because the temptation is to pull to one side or the other. In their culture, it was, this is a struggle, is if they pull away from the traditions, then they pull away from their family. I heard recently, uh, I can't remember which country it was in, but there's a, I want to, I can't remember, but I heard recently that a lot of people in Islam were converting in a, in a I want to say maybe in West Africa somewhere, but what they were talking, what the, what the guy was talking about is as soon as they put their faith and trust in the Lord, their whole entire family, it's, they they basically shut off their whole entire culture. Their family will completely shut them out. So if you grow up in your Islam and Muslim, and if you convert to Christianity, you're going to lose your whole entire family. And so in their culture here, Colossae is facing, the temptation is, if, if I pull away from this, I'm going to lose everything with my family. I'm going to lose the whole aspect. If, if I don't buy, abide by all of those Jewish traditions and laws, then I'm going to be shunned by the whole entire family. And then on the other side of things, it's so new age, if you will. It's so far out there in the way that they were looking at things. And it was all man-made religion is what it brought itself to on both sides of things. And so what he's warning them to is, hey... You need to stand firm in what we taught you through the scripture. To stand firm in what you learned and what you saw in us, the character of who Christ is, you need to stand firm in your faith. Stand solid. Don't go to the right or to the left. Stay right here where we put you in the cross and what we taught you and what you were brought up then. And so as we look at that thought process today, 
He's calling us to stand firm. He's calling the Colossians to stand firm in their faith, what they have learned. And so chapter 3 is really going to say, okay, that's a good thought. How do we live it out? How do we put this into practice? How do we actually do this? That's a question I'm always asking myself is, this sounds great. How do I do that? How do I live this out? That's a, that's a part that a lot of times is hard for us to understand. How do we put this into practice? And so this is what we're going to find out today in chapter 3 is how do we put our Christian life into practice? How do we live out what it means to be a follower of Christ, to stand firm? What does this mean? What does that look like? So let's start chapter 3, verse 1 and 2. He says, if then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God, and set your mind on things that are above and not on the things that are on the earth. Now, I want you to look at Romans chapter 12. This follows right along with Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. So he's saying, don't put your mind on the things of the earth. You need to put your mind, if, if you then have been raised with Christ, this is how you ought to think. This is, this is where you put your mind at. And it's important how we think because our, think, our thinking is what leads out to our actions. Romans 12, 1 and 2 says... I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God. So this, this, is, this is how we live this out. Present your body a living sacrifice. And as I see that, I say daily. We are living on a day-to-day -day basis. So every day, this is how you present yourself. Holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So we need, we need to change the way we think from the way the world thinks, the way the world sees things, to the way God sees things. How do we do that? We do that through study of our scripture. We study the scripture we begin to understand God's image. He's the one that wrote this. And as we begin to understand his image and who God is, then we can begin to understand who we are and how we should be, how we should think, how we should act, how we should live out our lives in relation to God and in relation to people around us. And so we have got to change the way from our worldly thinking, from our own perspective, from our sinfulness and our selfishness, we have to present ourselves on a daily basis to God, saying that, Lord, help me. I'm not, I don't, help me from thinking the way I think. Help me think like you think. Help me see people how you see people. Help me to be able to love in the way that you love. That's how we are to be changing the way we think. That's how we are to put our things on the mind, on Things are, are set up on above. The things that God would think about. Not on the things of the earth. Because we know that the things of the earth are passing away. The things of the earth are focused on self. All of this worship that was over here was focused on all kinds of things. But it was man-made. As well as their traditions were also man These They had those elements to their worship were man-made things. And we know from the example of Solomon that none of those man-made aspects of religion are enough to keep you from indulging into your sinfulness. Nothing that we have ever come up with, nothing that man has done will keep you from sinfulness. There's nothing that we can come up on or, or do that would save us. There's nothing that can pay the penalty for our sins. There's nothing that can bring us out of that. Only through the power of Jesus Christ, only through understanding and seeing how he sees things and understanding that, that's what we are to put our mind and set our mind on. Verses 3 and 4, he says, For you have died... 
and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. So now here, this is a good verse on identity. You have to understand this is what's happening to us. As we put our faith and trust in him, our life is hidden with Christ and God. We have died. We have died to ourselves. We have died to the way that we think of things. We have died to the way that we set up this man-made thing. We died to all of that. Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. That means I have died with him. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. So it's him who lives in me. And so in, in that thought process, my identity rests completely and solely with Christ, not with anything else, not with anything man-made or any man-made structure or any man-made philosophy or thought or process or anything like that. There's nothing here that represents me with my relationship with Christ. My representation is Christ himself. That's where it should be. It should not be in anything else. If you're tying your identity into anything else, your focus is going to be wrong. And that tie into any other identity, I promise you, it will disappoint you. It will let you down at some point. It can, there's nothing that is designed to satisfy us and to sustain us and to bring us salvation other than Christ alone. But sometimes we fool ourselves with this and we all want to put our identity, especially guys, we put our identity in what we want to do and what we do in life. You meet another guy in the first few minutes, you're going to say, what do you do? If it's not obvious, what do you do for a living? Ladies, you'll do this with your kids and your relationships and things like that. Who, who did you marry? How many kids did you have with your home? And we put our focus on that sort of thing. We put our identity in that. And those are great things, and those are part of who we are, but it can't be the sum total of who we are. It can't be the complete identity of who we are. Because if it is, at some point, those worldly things are going to let you down. Or you might lose them, or they might go away who knows what the case might be and your focus and your identity will be on the wrong thing so your identity has to rest in the lord it says here you have died and your life is hidden in christ that is if you have been raised with him if you put your faith and trust in him when christ who is your life appears then you also will appear with him in glory and again, I said this, the time that we have now on earth is not the time for self-promotion. This is not time for me to uplift myself. This is not time for me to do my own thing or none of that. My time will come. It'll come with Christ and I'll appear with him in glory in due time. See, for those of us, there's two judgments. One is the great white throne judgment, and the other one is the Bema seat judgment. Now, everyone is judged at the great white throne judgment, but those of us who have put our faith and trust in Christ, we are, instead of the white throne judgment, we go to the, what's called the Bema seat judgment. Now, the difference in these two judgments are at the, white throne, the great white throne judgment, God is going to judge all of mankind. And if you have not placed your faith and trust in God, he is going to judge you based on the works that you have done on the earth. And have you done enough good works to save yourself? No one can. Good luck. It's not, you're not going to, I don't believe in luck. Um, there's not going to be enough good works. It's going to burn up. He's, and his judgment is going to be righteous and true in that regard. But for those of us who have put our faith and trust in Christ, then we go to the Bema Seat Judgment. The Bema Seat Judgment is similar to, a, it's been described as a military style of an award ceremony. If, having been in the military, I earned a few awards, and in those times we're in formation, and the commander calls you out for something you did and hands you an award, and it'll be something similar to that. 
I'm not sure exactly how all that's going to play out, but I know it's going to be a wonderful t- time and a wonderful thing. And in that moment and in that time will be what he's talking about here. Then you also will appear with him in glory. So in glory with the father, he recognizes the aspects of your worship towards him, what you have done for the kingdom and that sort of thing. And we lay all of our crowns back down at his feet anyway. So it's still not a self-promotion. It's just recognizing the wonderful things that occurred in our worship to him. And so there's a proper in place and time for that. And that's not here and now for me. For, for us... As believers in Christ, our time now is very valuable time. And it's short. We don't have a lot of it. When we're young, we feel like we do. But uh, you, the thing about life is it can come and go so fast that you, our, our time is very important. And so he's going to lay out here exactly how do we live out this time that we have now how should we live how should we make the most of the time that we have so let's uh, look at uh, verse 5 so there's, there's going to be two contrasting kind of lists here the first one is things that we should put to death verse 5 says put to death therefore what is earthly, earthly in you sexual immorality, impurity, passions, and evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these, you too once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them away, anger and wrath and malice and slander and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self, with its practices. So I made a couple of little lists here. I don't know if we, did we get one of those on a slide? You probably won't be able to see this one that well, but maybe you can see up there somewhat. So he says there, what should we put off? So this is what you, in the aspect of in Christianity, there's a lot of things that people say, well, it's a whole bunch, a list of do's and don'ts. That's what Christianity is. And there, yeah, there is a little bit of that. There's a little bit of do's and don'ts. But let's look at them. It's, this is what he's telling them, hey, this is what you were once engaged in. You used to be a part of this. Used to, this used to be how you looked. But you need to put those things off. We put our faith and trust in the Lord, and the motivation for us to put these things off is now different than we're not doing them just because it says don't do them. Don't do them. But there's a very important aspect to why we don't do these. He says, put off what's earthly. We looked at that. Don't be conformed to this world. This is the way the world thinks. This is the way the world operates. This is our sinful nature. Sexual immorality. That doesn't do anyone any good. That's not the character of the Lord. This is sexual immorality is not the way he has designed us. You can see it going on every day now with everything that's LGBTQ, everything that's transgender stuff that's so confused that you can't say male or female anymore. You don't know which bathroom to go to anymore. Uh, I mean, we could, you could dive off we could get so far off into sexual immorality stuff, it's absolutely insane. And that's it. The way of the world will lead you to insanity, earthly thinking in your selfishness. And let me make it real clear. LGBTQ, trans people, all of that are made in the image of God. They still have value. I'm not saying that. Don't get me wrong. But those ways of thinking lead you into a complete opposite design of how God has designed things. It's very clear in the scripture that God has designed man and woman, and those two make a marriage. That's what a marriage is, a husband and a wife. And in his design, we're going to get to the family design by the end of this. It's very important because God is designed... 
His, he has set up that structure for very specific reasons. Impurity, passions, evil desires, covetousness, anger, this mal- malice that's getting loud, um, outburst of anger, slander. Uh, we have a lot of, every time the, uh, Every time we go to vote, someone's got to slander somebody. <laughs> Obscene talk. That can come from a, a joke. That can, coarse jesting, joking. That can come from stuff we put on social media, offhanded comments that we make. Do not lie to one another. None of these things help anybody. None of these things show the character of who God is. None of these thinks of the other more highly than himself. This is all self-focused. This is all me, I. This is all focused on what I want, my expectations. And it's absolutely the things that we should not engage in. This should not be who we are. This is, does not show who God is. This does not show his character Whatsoever, So we should put those things away. We should not be a part of those things. But then it says, let's see in verse 10, and have put on the new self. So we are to do away with these old practices, the old self. We're to put that away, get rid of those things. And then we are to put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of the creator. Says, now that's what I was talking about. The renewing of your mind. This is, this is the renewing of your mind right here. This is what's taking place. It's renewed in the knowledge. After the image of the creator. This is the knowledge he has given us. And as we study that. It shows us who the creator is. And before that. It even told us that all of these things. The wrath of God is coming. Because of all of these things. So when we engage into these things, we are standing in God's wrath. That's what we draw upon ourselves is God's wrath when we engage into those things. So we put on this new image, the new self. This is what, he's, this is what it means to be a Christian is there's a newness to who we are. That newness is Christ Jesus himself. And this is what that looks like. We put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge after the image of its creator. Here, there is not Greek and Jew or circumcised or uncircumcised or barbarian or Scythian or slave or free, but Christ is all and in all. And what he means by this is with Christ, we don't have these aspects of separation anymore. There's not these things that divide us anymore. That when we all put our faith and trust in Christ, we all have unity in that. We are all unified in Christ. We're no longer separated from one another. Because the ways of the earth, earthly thinking, is we will separate one another. We'll separate each other by skin color, by uh, how much money you make, uh, male or female, or or whatever... (laughs) It is now. Anything that we can divide ourselves on, we will do it. That's the ways of the world is to divide ourselves. And we know from Scripture that if a house is divided, it cannot stand. It will fall. And that's what the devil is good at is dividing us. He wants to divide us. He wants us to separate. He wants us not to meet together. He wants us not to encourage one another. That's, that's the, the ways of earthly thinking will always go in that direction is separation and destruction and that's what it is but that's not the ways of God that's not who he is that's not his character it's not his character to separate us but then verse 12 says put on then as God's chosen ones holy and beloved compassionate hearts kindness humility meekness and patience bearing with one another If one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, 
which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which you were called in one body, and be thankful. And let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, and singing songs and hymns and spiritual songs, songs and thankfulness in your heart to God. So, so there is an, things that now we are to put on. We are to put away with these old things, and we are to put on some, some new things. <clears throat> these things bring us unity. These things bring us together. We are to put on a compassionate heart. We are to have kindness. Uh, uh, we talked about a definition of kindness in youth group this morning. Uh, Anybody, any youth in here remember what we, was the definition of kindness? <laughs> the definition of kindness that we talked about was that, what was it? I need Ken in here to tell me. It was, it was putting, instead of showing your strength, it was, um, oh, instead of showing some, it was, here we go. The definition of kindness that we talked about was <clears throat> lending your strength to somebody instead of highlighting their weakness. And I thought that was a really good statement. I'm lending my strength to somebody instead of highlighting what their weakness is by being kind. <clears throat> Humility and meekness and patience, bearing with one another, forgiving one another as the Lord, the Lord forgave us. And we should be willing to forgive one another. We should love, we should let the peace of God dwell in our hearts. Be thankful and let the word of Christ dwell in us. We should teach each other. We should admonish, admonish means uh, that we should give advice, that we should caution people, that we should warn people who are, uh, so that they can have wisdom and understanding. We should sing songs. We should be thankful in our hearts towards God. And everything that we should do, we should do in the name of Jesus. This is his character. This is who he is. And when we begin to live out these kind of things, what we do is we take on the character of God. And then that character is shown to people around us. And then... They might not understand who God is at all. They might not know anything about God. They might not have ever read one scripture in the Bible. They might not have ever went to church in their life. They might not know anything about who God is. But they can begin to see who he is through us and through our actions. And, and we're not perfect and we're not gods or anything like that. But we can show people his character we can paint this physical picture so that people can understand the relationship we have with Christ. And in so doing, the, the relationship that we have with them. And it's a beautiful thing that when we do this, like, it, like he said here, put on love which binds everything together in perfect harmony. The love of Christ, Christ-like love, that's a guarantee and that's a promise it doesn't mean it'll be easy, but this is, this is the outcome of that when we do this, is it binds us together. This is the kind of thing that binds our family together. And our family ain't easy. <laughs> There's nothing easy about it. That's our motto. We don't do easy. <laughs> and, but when we, when we strive to live this way with God and with each other, it binds our family together in a perfect love that only you can only have a perfect harmony in this way. Verse 17, and whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Now look at verse 18. Now he's going to talk about the structure of the family. And we talked about this a little bit last week, how the structure is changing for the Colossians because now as they put their faith and trust in God, it's no longer their faith and trust in the government. 
It's no longer their faith and trust in old traditions. It's no longer faith and trust in this nuances of these new age waves of things that are going on with the worshiping of angels. <clears throat> the scripture is clear that we are not to worship angels. <clears throat> and so this is changing the dynamic of their homes because now if you look back at chapter 2, verse 10, it says, And you have been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority. For us as Christian believers, the head of all rule and authority for us is Christ Jesus. Nothing else. No one else. We are loyal to him. Our identity is in him. That's who our authority is. Now, so that changes the structure of the home, especially in that time frame. It will change the structure of your home, too, when you, if you put your faith and trust in the Lord. So here's part of the structure. First of all, he speaks to wives in verse 18. He says, wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. So the, the aspect of your submission is fitting to the Lord. You're doing it for the Lord. This, you're structuring yourself and you're living yourself this way. You are becoming uh, humble and with meekness. You are submitting yourself to the, to the structure that God has designed. <clears throat> and in so doing, you are pleasing to God. You're pleasing him by living that out. And the beautiful thing about that is you're not trying to please your husband. You're, try, you're pleasing God. There's a big difference in trying to please your husband and pleasing God. Because if you try to please your husband, he will probably never be satisfied. Because he's always going to, you're not designed to carry that weight. The expectations and the weight of that is not in the structure of how we are designed. At some point, he's going to let you down. At some point, you're going to let him down. At some point, you're going to mess up. At some point, he's going to get upset with you. You can't get everything cleaned in the house today. You can't get everything done. And whatever the world says you're supposed to get done tonight by 5 o'clock and a hot dinner on the table and the whole house clean and all the kids washed and the dogs clean, all, yeah, good luck. Because you probably can't get it done. You'll never be able to get it done. You'll never be able to meet all the expectations that the world says you're supposed to meet as a wife and a, taking care of the house and getting every, all the, it's, that's that's nuts, those kind of expectations. So you're not doing it for him. You're doing it for the Lord. And see, the thing about the Lord is that the Lord's value and the Lord's love is not based on a function or a condition. But see, that's the way our love is. That's the way we grow up in. And that's how we see most of our things in our world is if you get this done and you get that done and you do all of this and then I can love you, you're a good wife. That's the wrong focus. But when I understand you have value because you're made in God's image, God went to the cross and gave his whole life for you and the Father was willing to accept that and the way that he looks at you, how he created you, he, he put you together even before you were born, he knew you in your mother's womb, he knitted you together, and you have great and wonderful value no matter what capacity, no matter what you can do, none of that matters. You have wonderful value, and as I look at my wife, she has great value irregardless of anything that she can get done at the house today. And see, now the difference is as she lives her life for Christ, she can be submissive to me in that regard because she's doing it for him. She ain't doing it for me. That's beautiful. There's no other structure in the world that operates like that. Look at the next one. Husbands. Verse 19. Love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Do not be harsh with your wife. I can't tell you how many times in counseling people come into my office and as we talk and things, 
that verbal abuse is so much more damaging than physical abuse. The harshness with your words and your mouth. I've had women in my office tell me I'd rather be punched in the face than to be talked to that way. Because they could deal with getting punched. That'll heal. But the constant words, the constant belittling, the, all of that, no, it just constantly rolls around in their brain and it comes back up and they walk on eggshells with their husband because they're afraid of what he's going to say or how he's going to respond to the knee, what, what's going on. In the, they just want to express what's going on and he's going to say something if I say something and so I'm not going to say something so he didn't say something and then we just divide like this. And then five years, ten years down the road, we wonder why, what's going on. Don't be harsh with your wife. That's, here's why. Because God is not harsh with us as the church. He is not harsh with us. The book I'm reading is, right now is called Gentle and Lowly. That's the nature of God's heart. He is gentle and he is lowly. Meaning that when I cry out to him, he, he, will, he will come down to rescue me, to pull me in close to him, to heal me. The meaning that he is lowly means that Jesus Christ himself was the most approachable person that has ever lived on the face of the earth. He's more approachable than anyone has ever been approachable. You can go to him anytime in prayer. You can speak to him anytime. He's right here for you no matter what. How approachable are you, husbands? Can your wife, can you walk in the door in five minutes and your wife come start asking you questions and talking to you about what's happened on the day? Well, probably not. Can your wife come and just tell you stuff without you doing something about it? Can your wife come and talk to you without you reacting to it? Can she share her feelings with you? Can she share her needs with you without you blowing up about something or without you going off on something or without you reacting to it? Can your kids come talk to you? Can your kid come talk to you about what's going on at school? Does your kid feel that way? My kids don't feel that way with me. Not all the time. Maybe sometimes, not all the time. My kids don't feel that way. My wife don't feel that way all the time. Why? Because I get harsh. And it's not right. That's not God's character. And that's not who he is with us. Why would I be that? When I understand this is a character of who God is, I am to imitate his character as a dear child. So why would I be harsh to my wife? Because he wants me to treat her like he treats the church. How does he treat the church? I have never known in all of my time of being a Christian for God to ever treat us as a church harshly. Not when we cry out to him, never. Never would he respond like that. And when you start to respond harshly, guess what? Every time she wants to come talk to you and you're harsh... She probably not wanna gonna come wanna come talk to you anymore. She probably not gonna wanna share her feelings with you no more. Why? Because you every time you harsh. And that is the foothold that the devil grabs onto, and that's what begins to separate us in our families and in our homes. That's probably more detrimental than anything. If I had to put the top five most detrimental things you could do in a family, I would list that one right there in the top five. Husbands, be harsh to your wife. You want to destroy your family? Just be mean to your wife. Be harsh with her. Don't be approachable to your kids. You're going to tear your family down, I promise you. So he says that in order for this husbands to understand his character because he's not harsh with us he's approachable to us that's the way you should be as well to your wife and to your children now children verse 20 children 
Children, any children in here? Any children in here listening? Children, <laughs> obey your parents in everything. I love this verse right here, right? I love this verse. I second the motion on verse 20, for this pleases the Lord. Now see, again, children, you are not doing it to please your parents. You're doing it to please the Lord. And in your response, as you please the Lord, then things work in the way they should in regards, in relation to your parents. Now listen, this is why this one is so important. Because wisdom, wisdom only comes by way of obedience. The only way that you learn wisdom is through obedience. You don't learn wisdom in any other way. When you are obedient to God as a child of God, as we are obedient to him, then we gain wisdom. That's where, that's the, that's the avenue of wisdom is through obedience. And this is why he's saying this, obey your parents and everything for this pleases the Lord. And you begin to understand wisdom. This is why he has designed this structure that way. God designed the structure for children to obey mom and dad so that they learn wisdom. We talked about it this morning in the youth group is when you're young, you can see right here. <laughs> you can't see down here. Mom and dad can see down here. You can see right here. They warn you. They give you instruction. You are to obey that because they can see ahead and you can't. You haven't been there. You don't understand that. But as you obey them, it will protect you once you get down here. And us, as children of God, as we obey him, we begin to understand wisdom. Now, back to fathers again. Fathers, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. And this is part of what I'm meaning by when I talk about the aspect of uh, being approachable to them. Fathers have such an influence with what they say, how they respond to their kids. It's huge. You can drive a kid one way or the other, depending on how the, how the dad in the, is in the home. Uh, I've had uh, youth kids come to this church and say, well, my dad doesn't want to come to church, so why should I? Good point. If dad isn't invested, then why is the kid going to be invested? He's probably not. He's probably not. <clears throat> I've had uh, kids that have great fathers that pour into them, that, that value them, that spend time with them, super excited, have wonderful projections of what they're going to do in life down the road. And then we've had kids that have come to our youth group Parents don't care. Dad doesn't care where they're at. Dad kicks them out of the house. They get involved in drugs. They get in trouble. They go to jail. In our group, in the last four years, I could tell you story after story that if dad had an influence towards that kid, it'd make a whole complete world of difference for that kid. I know it would, would it have for me. I met my dad when I was 19. I spent 20 minutes with him. He told me he didn't want anything to do with me or my brother. That changed me. I, I learned what it meant to be a dad in 20 minutes. I learned what not to do. Whatever that guy did, don't do that. That's what I learned. That's how I learned how to be a dad. Just don't do what he did and you'll be all right. If you... <laughs> You'll be okay if you just don't do anything he did. Like, you can't get any worse than that. Dads, I promise you the influence you have on the children. Don't provoke your children unless they become discouraged. You could provoke your child by not ever saying a word to them. You want to provoke your kid? Just don't say nothing to them. Just don't spend no time with them. Just don't care about what they're involved in. Just don't care about where they're at. Just don't care, and you'll provoke that child to be discouraged, I promise you. Promise you, you will. 
That's not his character towards us. The reason he says this is to show this is not his character. God's character is to spend time with our children, to invest in our children, to be forgiving of that child, to not put the expectations that I have for myself onto my kid. My kid's not in my position. He can't live up to the expectations I have in the position I'm in. I can't do that to my kid. My kids don't know what it means to be down here yet. I can't fault my kid for not understanding this when they can only see right here. I need to be patient with that kid. I need to bear with that child. I need to have kindness. I need to have compassion towards that child. That's the character of the Lord towards children. Now, verse 22, bond servants. And some versions might say slaves. You know, if we were to take a look at this in modern times now, you could say workers. As you go to work tomorrow, a lot of you are going to go to work in the morning. Workers obey, bond servants obey in everything. Those who are your earthly masters. Not by the way of eye service as is people pleasers. But with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord, whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men. Now, I think this is so beautiful because I've had a lot of bosses that I had to work for that I didn't really like. <laughs> and when you get a boss that you don't like and when he doesn't do what he's supposed to do and he tolerates bad employees and, and the standards are low and, and he cusses you out at work or whatever the case is. Uh, I'm just saying that because that's what I've had with bosses I've had in the past. And um, no, by the way, none of this pertains to Pastor Mark, okay? Um, but as, as you go to work tomorrow, do your work towards the Lord. Not, not just eye service, not just, not just getting by, not just to look good, but you're doing this for the Lord in the fear of the Lord, and whatever you do, do it as the Lord, not to men. That, to me, is so beautiful. That, to me, is so, I can rest in that. I can have freedom in that, because I know, like, even if I show up to work tomorrow, and I don't like it, and I don't like the boss I have to work for, I, hey, man, I ain't doing this for him. I'm doing this for the Lord. And as I do that for the Lord, and as I work in the way we should, I mean, honestly, we should be the most hardest working people there are. And as we do that, we show the character of who God is to that boss who might be lost. And you might hate working there. It might be the worst job you ever had. And that dude is a jerk. But hey, stop and think for a minute. Hey, I'm a Christian. I'm a follower of God. Why would God want me to work here? Maybe God wants you to work there in that condition because maybe God is working through you to reach that boss. Maybe that boss never even comes to the Lord. Maybe he doesn't. But at least he sees the character and love of Christ through you while you're there. Maybe it's just the other people around you that see it. And people could look at you and be like, this boss is a jerk. But this guy does what he says, and he works hard. What is up with that guy? Because the rest of us are knocking off 15 minutes early today and not telling him. The rest of us are doing something that we shouldn't be doing because we don't really like that guy anyway. And who would want to follow this guy as a leader? But here you are over here working hard, doing everything the way you should, and you show the character of the Lord that even while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So even while you have a jerky boss, you can work hard for him. It's the character of the Lord. That's why he says this, because he wants you to show his character to those you are around, because God has a purpose and a plan for your boss's life or the people you work with or the people around you or your family, your wife, and your kids. God has a plan for them, and God is using you, and he's placed you in the family that you're in, and he's placed you in the workplace that you're in because God is going to work a miracle through you that you, as, as you live this out, as you put on these characteristics of who he is, he's working in the life of somebody else. It ain't about you. 
It's not our time now to, to how did it say up here? Um, our life is hidden in Christ. It's not for us here who your life is appears. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will appear with him in glory. We're not trying to appear our life. We're trying to show his through ours. And it's a neat, I just think that's a beautiful thing that God does with us. Verse 23, whatever it is that you do, do it heartily as for the Lord and not men. Knowing, verse 24, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. You are serving the Lord. We know we will receive an inheritance. We know we have the Holy Spirit in us. We see that in Romans chapter 5. I'm just going to read that. I know I don't have it on my thing. But look at how beautiful this is. Look at Romans chapter 5. When he says, not verse 3, not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance or patience. And that endurance produces the character. That's the character I'm talking about, God-like character. And that can, character produces hope. And I always, look, as I always say this, I say that only re, only way that you can have hope is through action. And as I look on this and as I study it, the only way you're going to have any action is if you have character. If you don't have character, you're not going to take action. And if you don't take action, ain't nobody got any hope in your life. If you don't take on the character of Christ, you will not take action in your family and your family will have no hope. This is why this is important. Because when we begin to understand God's character and we understand that God's character always takes action. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. From the very first verse, he took action. And when we take action, other people have hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who's been given to us. If you try to act in your earthly character, I promise you what you will do is you will just, men, I promise you, this is what you're going to do. If you try to act in earthly character, you won't. You'll just stand there and you'll watch it happen. I promise you, you will. Because from the very start, from Adam and Eve, Adam was there with his wife. It's clear in the scripture. He was there. He knew what he should have done. God was clear to them. You're not to eat from this tree I because you will die. He knew that. He had told it to Eve. Eve knew it. Eve told it to the serpent. And when Eve stands and takes from the tree, what does Adam do? Nothing. He didn't take action. He took the wrong action. He ate with her. And I promise you, if you try in your earthly character to do something, this is what you'll do. You'll become sexually immoral. You'll become impure. You'll have evil desires. You'll be angry. You won't be approachable. This is why understanding what he's saying here is so important. Knowing that from the Lord, you will receive an inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. When we live this out, we know. We see these characters in ourselves. We see the fruit of the Spirit. We have the Spirit in us. This is the fruit. When we see that, we have hope. We know the Holy Spirit's with us. And we know when we act this way, we're living out the scriptures. We're actually living our service to Christ through what he has designed for us to do. And it's a promise. You will receive your inheritance. That is him, Christ himself. That's the inheritance. It's a promise. He's promising you this. Now, verse 25 Here's the opposite, uh, or here's, here's the admonishment. For the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong that he does, and there is no partiality. I'm gonna read, I want to read two, little verse, two sections of verse. First one I want to read is Romans. Actually, the first one is Hebrews chapter 2, 
verses 1 through 4. Hebrews chapter 2. Therefore, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. That's our nature is to drift away from what we've heard. This is what we have been raised up in, provided that you've come to church and been taught and things out throughout your life. We must pay closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. For since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable... And every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution. How shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? It was declared at first by the Lord, and it was attested to us by those who heard. While God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles, and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. How... Shall we neglect such a great salvation? We have such a wonderful and great salvation that has been given to us, assurance of our faith and what Christ has done on the cross for us. How and why would we neglect it? Why would we go back to those old things like we talked about in chapter 2? Why would we go back to all of those things when God has declared these things to be good? Why would we go back to doing all of this? Why would we go back to this? Why? Why would we neglect what God has promised to us? Look at Romans chapter 8. Verses 31 through 32. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will we not also with him graciously give us all things? See, this is an important thing right here that what he says here. He's like, he who did not spare his own son. He did not spare his own son. Meaning, even his, his son went to the cross and his son became sin who knew no sin. He took on all of our sins. So we have to... Keep in mind that even his son had to go to the cross. He took on our sins for himself. He was perfect, but he took on our sins. That's what he did for us. He paid for that. But it says real clear here that the wrongdoer will be paid back for his wrong that he has done. And there's no partiality. There's no partiality there. Uh, there's, not, there's not something that... If, if, you, if you continue in these old, if you continue in these ways of the world, if you continue in this, if you go back to this, there's a promise to you right here that you'll be paid back for the wrongdoing that you do. There's no partiality. That should be a warning of admonishment to us. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 39 says... <laughs> I'm going to mess it up if I try to quote it. Just look it up. Hebrews 10.39 says, But we are not those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith and preserve their soul. This is not us anymore. This is not you. This is, he's Paul telling them, Colossians, this is not you. If you've been brought up in the faith, what you've seen in us and what you've been taught, this ain't you. This is not his character. This should not be yours. You should not engage into these things. Because all this is going to do is it's going to be focused as a self-made religion. You're going to worship yourself, which uh, is devil worship. That's what devil worship is. Self. People who are devil worshipers don't worship the devil. They worship themselves. That's what they do. This is that character. This is the character of the earth. This doesn't help anyone. This hurts everyone. Sexual immorality hurts everyone. Impurity in your life hurts everyone. Wrongful passions hurts everyone. Evil desires hurt people. Covetousness hurts neighbors. Anger hurts your family. Malice hurts your family. Slander hurts everyone around you. Obscene talk hurts everyone around you. Lying to one another. I mean, it hurts everybody. That's what it does. That's all it can do. It doesn't know anything else. 
But when we put on these things of the character of Christ, a compassionate heart, a kindness, a humility, all of these things, and there's way more to list than just this on both sides, but all of these things, the character of the Lord is what binds us together. It's what binds our families together. It's what binds this church together. It's what binds us all together in Christ. This helps people. This loves people. This lifts people up, encourages people. I don't know which side that you're on today. I don't know which side you want to be on. Because this side probably feels good to some degree. Sinfulness, you probably feel good for a moment. But it costs you more than you expect. And this ain't easy. It's not always easy to bear with one another. It's not always easy to forgive somebody. It's not always easy to love someone that's not easy to love. Some people aren't teachable. You can't teach people. Some people you can't admonish. Some people aren't. It's, it's, these things are not easy. But the difference is these paint the picture and show God, shows who he is. It shows his character. And people see that through us as we live it out. And this is what he's pointing out. This is how you live it out. This is the character of the Lord. And this is what you're to be. It's not on this side or that side. It's centered in Christ, in him. That's who it is. And that's who we should live out our lives for. That's who we should aim to please. I shouldn't aim to please my wife or my kids or my boss or anybody else. I aim to please the Lord. And when I do that, all of those people benefit from it. When I please the Lord, my wife will be pleased. My kids will be pleased. My boss will be pleased. And the church will be pleased when I strive to live my life in this way. And that's such a beautiful way to live your life the way God has designed it. It's a thing that unifies us. It doesn't separate us. And it's so wonderful when we do this. So <clears throat> Colossians 3 is just a wonderful blueprint, if you will, to how we should live it out, how we should, when we walk out the door in a few minutes, when we get home, wives, submit to your husband. It's fitting to the Lord. Husbands, don't be harsh with your wife. Children, obey your parents. I mean, you, you can go and do these three verses in the next 10 minutes. You can begin to live this out, and I promise you, it'll change the dynamic of your family. I promise you, if you go to work tomorrow, and when you clock in, you take on what this really says, and you really do it at work tomorrow, I promise you, it'll change the dynamic at your job. And keep in mind, the Lord is working in everyone around you, and he's placed you in the midst of every one of those people to reach them through your obedience. And when your obedience, then comes wisdom. And with that wisdom comes the character. With that character comes the action. And with that action comes the hope the hope of Christ and everyone around you will have hope. And I can tell you right now, when you look, turn on your TV and you look at everything going on, ain't nobody got very much hope in anything. And I promise you some people are looking for some hope. And the people who are looking for hope might be your wife and it might be your kids. It might be your boss. It might be a fellow student. I mean, I guess school's out because you probably just did your finals in college just last week. It might be the teacher who teaches you. Who knows? We don't know. But when we live it out, it's a beautiful thing that we show hope to everybody. If you would, bow your heads and pray with me as our worship team comes up. Lord, we thank you so much for blessing us, Lord, with the character of who you are. Lord, we thank you so much for blessing us with the actions that you took on the cross Lord, that you paid for our sinfulness and you made it possible that we don't have to go back and live in these old ways anymore. We don't have to engage into our self-made whatever. Lord, we don't have to be sins of what the earth, we don't, we don't have to be slaves to what the earth says that we have to be, what the world says 
what they dictate. Lord, we thank you so much for showing us the structure of our family and how we should, how we should act with one another, Lord, how the value you have placed on us, Lord, is uh, not a conditional value, Lord, is, is completely unconditional. And the type of love that you show us, Lord, is p- completely unconditional. I pray you would give us strength, Lord. It's not easy for us to, look, to do those things, Lord. But I pray that you would give us strength and you would give us the character to love one another the way that you love us. Lord, I pray that if there's anyone this morning who doesn't understand this kind of love and they don't understand who you are, Lord, I pray you would just put it on their heart, Lord, that you would continue to draw them to you, Lord. And uh, Lord, we... Thank you so much for the full assurance of faith that we have, or you promise us, or we know we will gain our inheritance, or we know because we have the Holy Spirit who's been poured out into our heart, or we thank you so much for that. I pray if anyone here doesn't understand that, or you would continue to speak to them, to put people in their path, and that you would show us people around us that need to know who you are, Lord, and that we would have the courage and the guts and the grit, or to do the things that aren't easy and to live it out in front of them and to live out what we claim to believe in, and that's you, Father. Lord, we thank you so much, and we give you all honor and glory now in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you all like to stand with us, please?
right. Thank you all so much for being here today. Appreciate uh, y'all being here. Great to see everyone. Um, if you're with the food bank, we're just going to take a short break and get uh, things set up for that. For that. Um, just be back in here in, in a few minutes and we'll get started. And I won't keep you very long with that. 